I was asked to talk about lithosphere mantle coupling and uh, made the decision to talk about lithosphere mantle coupling in Western North America. But given the interest in this meeting in Eastern North America, I changed the title to uh, lithosphere mantle coupling in North America. So I'm going to focus on that uh, using a global scale approach and then we'll zoom in to the East Coast and then the West Coast. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors. Uh, uh, where's our cursor? Nope. And uh, I'd also like to acknowledge Atre Ghosh and Zingo Wang. Uh, for they've done a lot of the recent mo global modeling that I'm going to be talking about. And uh, I'd like also to thank Seth Stein, Frank Zogli, and Ann Meltzer for motivating uh, the focus on the East Coast. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank NSF Geophysics and Earthscope and SCEC for support. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible without their support. And uh, finally, UNAVCO and IRIS. So to understand the uh, coupling beneath North America, we've got to look at the tomography. This is a model from Lekic and Romanowitz, a shear wave model. It's relatively low degree, but it shows what I want to show. And if this dot here on the west coast is located here. To understand the dynamics beneath North America, we have to understand or look at the history of subduction. So this is imaging the Farallon plate. This is the, basically shows uh, this higher speed body is the, represents the subduction history of the Farallon plate that so many seismologists have, have imaged and described. Uh, so global models are going to have to take that into account. We would make assumptions about velocity to density scaling and then solve momentum equations using an inferred radial and lateral viscosity variation to solve for the flow. An example of that, this is another tomography model from Ritzema et al. This shows the fundamental property of the flow field, the first order flow field I'm going to be talking about today. Beneath eastern North America, The flow vectors in the mantle are moving westward and then down. Beneath western North America, I'm going to talk about this, the flow vectors are moving eastward. This doesn't show the velocity of the upper plate of the lithosphere, but the, the flow vectors are moving east. So if you take your hands and uh, this is my outreach part. And Point your hands together. Your right hand is the flow vector beneath eastern North America. Your left hand is the flow vector beneath western North America, and they're converging and heading down. Now, this is an oversimplified picture, but it's a first order picture. I'm going to point out there's problems with that picture in western North America. So this flow, velo this flow field in the upper mantle imposes tractions on the base of the lithosphere. And these tractions integrate over great distances and have a profound influence on the stress field within the lithosphere. And therefore, they have an influence on the deformation field within the plate boundary zones. So this is a, an important feature I'm going to be talking about. If you look in detail beneath eastern North America, the mantle flow field, these tractions, which are bet between 5 and 10 megapascals for our best calculations. These tractions are heading westward, basically moving with roughly in the direction of plate motion, which is moving from the upper right to the lower left. So the mantle flow field is leading the plate here. That's required by our stress models. In Western North America, the mantle flow field resists motion and actually acts against the propensity for that higher topography to undergo gravitational collapse. And I'm going to talk about later in the talk how that's a problem in these models and there must be something else going on in that small scale convection. The 
Theron plate subduction history not only impacts present day stress state and dynamics of the planet or of North America, but it's also had a profound influence on the uh, dynamic topography through time of North America. And Gernis's group has looked at this a lot. This is a paper by Spesojevic, Leo and Gernis, and they looked at the history of subduction and modeled that through time and predicted the dynamic topography. This is 90 million years, Cretaceous. And with that prediction of topography, they predicted the uh, Cretaceous seaway uh, or, or relative sea level change. And they verified their models by comparing them with stratigraphic record. So I'm going to talk about a global model um, and then zoom in. Uh, this is a global model that worked with Atre Ghosh. It's a model of the lithosphere. It is composed of two parts. It has topography, including dynamic topography and lithosphere structure. And then it has the contribution of coupling with mantle flow. Atre tested a number of models, uh, hundreds of them forward models, and compared them with world stress map observations deformation indicators, and surface velocities, and narrow down a fairly narrow range of viscosities that work. Of course, you need plates um, and plate boundary zones. The plate's best viscosity is in the range of 1 times 10 to the 23 Pascal seconds. A stronger craton, deformable keels, actually. We couldn't handle strong keels. And uh, a weak asthenosphere channel. 1 times 10 to the 20 Pascal seconds was very, very important in these models. The plate motions are not prescribed a priori, so that's one of the outputs that we compare with observables to test how, how good these models are. I forgot to mention that the mantle flow fields are constrained by the history of subduction models and tomography models. Um, The red vector is the uh, predicted velocity field from the global model in a no net rotation frame. The blue vector is a kinematic model from Kramer et al. And uh, we obtained a RMS velocity misfit of about one centimeter per year for our best models. We're going to zoom into the east coast now at the stress field predicted there. But I mentioned that we break it up into two parts, a part associated with topography and lithosphere structure, and a part associated with mantle flow. So this is the lithosphere structure alone. And contour here in color is a gravitational potential energy per unit area. Gradients of this produce or are balanced by gradients of deviatoric stress. So we can solve force balance equations for the deviatoric stresses associated with these GPE differences. The deviatoric stresses are plotted here. Actually, these are depth integrated stresses. So this length here, depth averaged over 100 kilometers, would be 30 megapascals of deviatoric stress. The uh, bold vectors represent the principal axis of compressive deviatoric stress, and these small open vectors are uh, principal axes of tension. This is the Virginia earthquake. Um, people were asking me yesterday why we got a strain concentration or strain rate concentration in the Appalachians. Appalachians. Um, corrected yesterday, and uh, also a strain concentration offshore. Um, the reason for that is that we get a gravity, gravity potential energy low in the central Appalachians and also offshore near the transition between uh, continental and oceanic crust. This causes a focusing of compressional deviatoric stresses. We also get this gravitational potential energy high along the, along the uh, eastern coast, uh, near the eastern coast. So basically, this stress field can't explain the seismicity, the focal mechanisms. It doesn't explain the, the Virginia quake. But it's important because it modulates the, the total stress field. I'm going to now bring in the contribution from mantle flow. That's the total. So in, beneath the East Coast is a dramatic change. This is addition of the two solutions to give you the total solution. Um, it's a big change. So the, so the big dominant player in terms of so what's contributing the most stress beneath eastern North America is the effects of this mantle flow, the mantle leading the plate. 
these are focal mechanisms from CMT, and uh, the red are the CMT, uh, global CMT solutions, and blue are from the literature pre-CMT. You can see mainly it's rust fault mechanisms. And we get a pretty good agreement with the compressive principal axes of deviatoric stress and the compression direction along, the, along this east coast. And then there's this rotation of compressive stress to northeast, southwest, and there's an agreement here. But we don't predict that transition very well. Uh, it appears to be more rapid in reality from, from this east-west or northwest-southeast to northeast-southwest here. Um, it appears to be strongly controlled by the strength contrast by, uh, between a strong core interior and, and uh, what we assume to be a lower viscosity, 1 times 10 to 23 pascal seconds in, in this area, sandwiched between a strong old oceanic lithosphere that we assume to be 1 times 10 to 24. So what's important in the future, I believe, is much better constraints on the crustal structure in the area, which is going to be enabled by the TA. And uh, that's going to be very important for, for understanding more the dynamics on the eastern coast. And also, as the TA moves, we're going to get better resolution on tomography models. Brandon Schmatt mentioned what they're actually achieving out west. And uh, incorporating that, the dynamics associated with that high resolution tomography is going to be critical as well. I'm going to zoom over to the western coast and zoom in the global model to the west coast. The uh, global solution that we get fits the strike slip deformation really well, but it basically fails to predict the pure extension across the Great Basin. And, and we can learn something from this. This is a best fit from the global model, but it breaks down in detail here in the western US. This is the velocity field that it predicts. It predicts, of course, Pacific North America plate motion fine, but we don't get the extension. So what's going on here is that counterflow effect from the deeper subducted Farallon material is just rolling through its coupling and it's shutting down the gravitational, uh, this is my interpretation, gravitational collapse effect that is needed to match great basin stretching. Too much coupling in this model. We can artificially lower the coupling by multiplying our attractions by 0.2, bringing them down to 1 to 2 megapascals. And now we get the extension, the opening in the great basin. But you can't artificially lower attractions. You have to derive them in a self-consistent global dynamic model but we have too much coupling there. Why? Uh, if I compare the, the prediction from the global model, these red vectors with the GPS, okay, again, it doesn't do bad, but I'm not happy with this because I don't know what's reducing the coupling. So what's missing in these models? One possibility is that there's laterally variable viscosity in the upper mantle. Most likely that's true. But we tried that, and for us it didn't work because if you lower the viscosity there, you'd think you'd lower the coupling, but you change the solution elsewhere. And everything's interconnected globally. So for us, there was a severe degradation of the solution elsewhere. Our models were happiest having a fairly uniform viscosity asthenosphere of 1 times 10 to 20 pascal seconds. What I strongly su suspect, and then what we're working on now, is that you have to account for the influence of smaller scale convection. These high resolution tomography models that Brandon so excellently summarized uh, show a lot of detail, and this has to be taken into account. Secondly, Wernicke and Davis and their colleagues have hypothesized that there's a mega detachment uh, beneath the Great Basin. And this is also something that we're investigating as a possible means for decoupling with mantle flow. Going back, uh, my work with Paul Silver, we tried to understand the shear wave splitting on the far, far western coast. And we, looking at the differential shear between this lithosphere motion we solve for a deeper mantle flow, and we got a best fit if that deeper mantle flow was roaring eastward 
okay, that looks pretty good in terms of this picture that I've described at the beginning of the talk, but of course we've known since then with more detail, there's a much more complex pattern, uh, this circular pattern was mentioned by Dr. Lin uh, around the central Great Basin. Uh, Zand and Humphreys described this and they, hy they hypothesize that there's a toroidal flow field around the edge of the subducting Juan de Fuca plate. So a picture is emerging, of course, of a more complex field of convection that contains another component, smaller scale than this large scale feature I've talked about. Work of West et al. has highlighted a upper mantle velocity anomaly that they call the Great Basin drip that extends quite deep beneath the central Great Basin. And Brandon Schmant just showed us many, many, you know, results that are fantastic and there's tremendous agreement now showing up between multiple different groups uh, showing these patterns. So again, I want to emphasize this is my dream, future dream is to incorporate this kind of resolution on a global scale and I think it's what's needed to understand the western U.S. in, in detail. New results, uh, Brian Porter and uh, Ryan Porter and Matt Fouch and their group uh, have now resolved new structure or new, 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 new models beneath the Great Basin and uh, they're interpreting uh, a, a, a chemical lithosphere here beneath the central Great Basin thinning on both sides and then this, they, they, they resolve the top of, of a, what is a, a thermal lithosphere appears to detach, have detached here. It, this may be the top of what West et al. Uh, imaged. And so this, these types of details I keep emphasizing are going to be important. Secondly, the, the, the fantastic lithospheric structure that's coming out, these models are coming out for Western US from receiver functions giving us crustal thickness variations. That also is going to be vitally important in the next generation of dynamic models that explain what's going on in Western North America. Related to this, I mentioned the decoupling. Wernicke et al. Um, noted these transient features that are spatially and temporally coherent over long wavelengths across the Great Basin. And they hypothesized the presence of a mega detachment. So we're looking at a number of possible hypothesis tests at present. One of them is that this smaller scale convection and the decoupling mechanism for it involves slip loading and periodic uh, very small slow slip on this mega detachment. So part of our research is to look very hard at the continuous GPS data in PBO. And uh, we're doing this right now. Um, th this is a, a, an out outreach part the what's what also research that we're doing with SCAC that um, we're providing a tool that is an automated geodetic network, network processing tool designed to detect statistically significant crustal strain transients. We um, remove the seasonal estimates from these GPS signals and then we apply a filter to them and model the displacement field as a function of time using finite element type models. We then subtract from these estimates of displacement and strain a reference model and then test whether it's statistically significant from what we interpret to be a steady state feature. So we're looking not only at the Great Basin, I'm going to just end by showing a movie here in uh, Southern California. And we, th this, this is a zoom in of Southern California. It's from a po the poster, it's Gina, this is Gina's work. Uh, her poster is um, upstairs. So these are the displacements between 2010.5 and 2012.5. Um, we calculated the total displacements and then subtracted a reference model. So what you're going to see, this is after El Mayor, is basically the growth or the change 
and the anomalous displacements with we know it's associated in some way with the post seismic response of El Mayor, but it's actually a fairly complex signal that is worthy of further investigation. So let me see if it works. There it goes. There's every 0.1 year increment. And so these are the residual or what differs between the GPS time series, what comes out of the GPS time series, and a reference model that is a steady state type model. Contour of the shear strains associated with the anom or anomalous magnitude of shear strain. So a fairly complex signal here. This, this has been described, for example, Pollitz et al. had a paper that looked at the post seismic effects. Um, but it's a fairly complex signal and we're able to evaluate the statistical significance of these anomalous strain. So we're looking at the entire plate boundary though uh, and, and uh, working to get that in an automated way. So in summary, I've talked about large scale mantle flow associated with the Farallon slab and that's related to the subduction history and it's a major driving mechanism for interplate and interplate stresses. Eastern North America, the mantle flow leads the plate and it's a dominant source for tectonic stresses there. Those stresses are responsible for the earthquakes. However, the detailed crustal structure on the East Coast obtained through the TA and other studies will be vital for better constraining dynamic models for the East Coast. For Western North America, the large scale flow is resistive but there's strong evidence for significant decoupling beneath the Great Basin. I mentioned the smaller scale convection there. It's there. It's a lot more complicated than this simple picture I painted. And that has to be considered to understand Western North America. And finally, we find strain transients everywhere. They're interesting and we find them everywhere. So that's it.